A couple years ago, uh, some of you may remember, I gave a talk on hacking voting systems. And it was while we were hacking the voting systems that we came across a question for which we, we just didn't have an answer. And the question is, um, if these voting systems are such crap, and they're so easy to, and to exploit, Every, everywhere you throw a dart, there's another um, exploitable vulnerability. Why is it that there hasn't been a single documented case of voter fraud because somebody has exploited one of these vulnerabilities? There isn't one case, and we looked. So we started thinking about this because this isn't right. Somebody, it's not like US elections don't matter. It isn't like there's not a hell of a lot of money going into this. So if you had $100,000, would you um, pay for advertising or hire somebody to, to make the election go your way? Um, and nobody's done it so far. So the only clue that we had, the only difference between a voting computer and any other type of computer is the fact that these systems are available to the public about three days a year. In other words, people haven't had time to learn them. So this makes a great hypothesis, but I'm a scientist. And you have to test a hypothesis. So what I'm going to talk to you about today are the results of my trying to test to see whether or not this works, or whether or not this, this hypothesis was actually correct. Now, I don't know how many of you write software or how many of you are software engineers, but the whole idea of software reliability finding bugs and fixing bugs, has been at the center of software engineering pretty much since the field has began. Um, the bug life cycle is highly predictable. This graph is from uh, um, the mythical man month. And if you know anything about software engineering, this is the Bible. Um, in 1975, when this book was published, he, um, Brooks created the, the, came up with the idea that um, when you release a piece of software, it's got a lot of bugs in it. And some of those bugs are easy to find. And those easy to find bugs get found really, really early. And then you fix them, and then they get a little harder to find. And you fix those, and they get a little harder to find. And eventually, the curve gets pretty low. And at that point, you know your software is fairly reliable. Right? Um, bugs are overwhelmingly discovered really immediately after the software is released. And then the curve drops, right? And this is remarkably stable over time. This graph is from 2008, which is 30 years after the publication of the Mythical Man Month. And it shows exactly the same phenomenon. The, um, the actual numbers of bugs found were, were higher than Brooks predicted they would be. But the curve is exactly the same. So even if we can't fix the bugs, we do know that this aspect of, the, of software defects, this is well understood. But, you know, we're security people, right? We don't really care about bugs, per se, unless they become vulnerabilities that we can exploit. So here are some, um, just a list of some, some um, conventional wisdom, some assumptions that we all make. The first is that vulnerabilities are bugs, right? They just have really, really nasty side effects. Um, the second really common assumption is that if we reuse software, software that's been out for a while, software that's been tested and has had a lot of its bugs removed, that makes the system more secure, right? It's new software that, that introduces new bugs. And the third um, assumption that we make is that if we can just improve the quality of our software, then we'll make it less vulnerable. If we can use the perfect um, type-safe programming language, and if we can find the perfect compiler, if we can just build those, then we'll have secure software, right? Um, well, no. This is what we found, that at least not in the early part of um, the life cycle of a product or a release of a product, this doesn't seem to apply. So here's what we did. We looked at a bunch of vulnerabilities, and we looked at just the early life cycle after each one, and in a nutshell, what we found is that there's this honeymoon period. It's immediately after release, software has this little bit of time that protects it. And this is going to have some really important implications that I'll discuss later on. So 
it actually looks like this. Instead of the way that, that, that the bug life cycle looks, with the curve starting high and then dropping down, um, the curve actually starts really low and speeds up. Um, Low-hanging fruit or not, easy to find vulnerabilities or not, software seems to enjoy some sort of protection from attack in the time immediately following its release. And that's what we're calling the honeymoon effect. So now I'll get into a few of the details for you. This is what we did. We collected 30,000 vulnerabilities from, and, and correlated them with all the major vulnerability people, bug track, Secunia, um, NIST NVD, OWASP. And then we looked at a, a list of the most popular programs, whether they were operating systems or server apps or user apps. And we ended up with 700 different releases. Then all we did, no fancy stati statistical analysis at all, all we did was count the number of days. The number of days from the official release of the product or a version of a product to the days of its first vulnerability, its second vulnerability, its third vulnerability, and its fourth vulnerability. And that's when we discovered that the, at the earliest part it seems to be safer here. So when I'm talking about a honeymoon period, um, this is what I mean. I mean that it's, it's the time. I can't see so, your laser pointer. Could you use a brighter one? <laughs> By the way, this is um, one of the co-authors of, of this work. This is Matt Blaze, um, professor at University of Pennsylvania. Um, so the honeymoon period is that time from the initial release to the first vulnerability. But there was a rather high variance because different products, different developers release at different rates and fix at different rates. So in order to normalize the data, we use a ratio. Um, we, we compare the release to the first vulnerability against the, the first vulnerability to the second. And if the time from release to, to, to V0 is greater than the time from V0 to V1, that's what we're calling a positive honeymoon. Okay? So I'm going to be using the term positive honeymoon and negative honeymoon a lot. Um, if, the, if the honeymoon period is shorter than the, than the time from V0 to V1, that's a negative honeymoon. Okay? Now, it's also important to realize that we're not comparing um, version 1 against version 1.5. We're only looking at the vul vulnerabilities within version 1 and comparing them against each other, and we're only looking at within version 1.5 against each other. Each release is looked at independently of the other, and this is important because of software quality issues. So here's what we discovered. In 62% of the releases we looked at, the honeymoons are positive. That means it takes longer to find the first vulnerability than it takes to find the second. This is exactly opposite of what is true for software reliability. And not only that, the time it takes to find that first vulnerability, the median number of days was 110. That's a long time. Um, and not only um, it, does it take longer to find the first one to the second, but but it is almost twice as long. The median overall honeymoon ratio is 1.54. That means it takes twice, almost twice as long to find the first vulnerability as it does to find the second. Um, okay, so there's a honeymoon effect. Um, big deal, what does it mean? Well, at first we thought that this was a result of software getting better. There's absolutely no denying that things like um, secure design initiatives, the use of type safe languages, um, fuzz testing. There's any number of things that, that make software that is written in 2010 of a much better quality than software that was written in 2001, right? So we broke it down by year. And this is what we found. It didn't matter. It doesn't matter what we look at, we have consistently positive honeymoons. And remember that our software reliability models tell us that we should find mostly negative honeymoons. We shouldn't find the, that there are, there's 50% or greater positive honeymoons no matter how we look at it. Um, so we broke it down every single way we could think of. We looked at just operating systems, consistently positive honeymoons. We looked at just server apps, same thing. User apps, same thing. We compared open source code to closed source code and it didn't matter. It takes longer to find the first vulnerability than it takes to find the second vulnerability. Um, so just for a second, 
Let's consider the implications of this. The fact is, every software release is likely to enjoy a honeymoon from attack in the period immediately, immediately after it's released, even though not a single one of the bugs that it's ever going to have have been fixed yet. This is contrary to our expectations based on, so on what we know about bugs. We'd expect that the newly released software is at its weakest. Every single bug it's ever going to have, even the easy ones, even the low-hanging fruit are still there. <coughs> Yet it's precisely at this time, precisely when it's at its weakest, that it's least likely to have an exploit discovered. OK, so this, this got us a bit confused. And we, we tried to figure out why. And what we discovered is this. Software has properties that are intrinsic to it and properties that are extrinsic to it. Intrinsic properties are the things that make a difference to software quality. They are how the initial product is designed, the, what type of language you choose to write it in, the skill of the programmer creates and um, is uh, important to the intrinsic properties of the software. But they're not important to whether or not it's vulnerable. That is related to the extrinsic properties, the things that the programmers and the developers themselves cannot control. And the extrinsic properties are legion. Um, they're everything from the operating system it's running on, from the network interfaces, from what other ap applications or products are running on the system at the time. From, um, they have to do with the black market and the economics. What does, what does a, a vulnerability for this particular product sell for? Um, there's so many of them, we don't know what they are, and um, we, ha we don't know how to measure them. But uh, we do know that a lot of these extrinsic properties are growing at a rate faster um, that we can measure. Things are getting worse. So if most of these extrinsic properties were responsible for the honeymoon period, we'd see the honeymoon period drop to zero because they are getting worse. But the honeymoon period is still consistently at 50% or greater. So most of the properties that are extrinsic to whether or not your software is going to be exploited don't matter to the honeymoon period at all. Um, what does matter? We got our first clue when we compared major releases to minor releases. Major releases of a product are intended to sell a new product. They contain the most new features. They have the most new code. Um, this is the primary difference because minor releases, excuse me, I need to drink. Minor releases are mostly bug fixes. Um, and while they do occur with a lot more frequency than major releases, they don't have nearly as much new code. <coughs> this implies that there's some sort of learning curve going on here. Um, and then our second clue came when we compared the difference between open source code to closed source code. What's really interesting here is that open source code has a longer honeymoon period, but it has a shorter honeymoon ratio. What that means is that it takes longer to find the first one than the second one, but it also takes relatively long to find the second one. Um, and what that seems to imply is that when it comes to attacking open source code, the attackers are not climbing the learning curve quite as quickly. And we think this is because open source code re re releases versions much more rapidly. And they're changing the code more rapidly. Um, but we're not sure about that, and we're, and we're going to be running some other tests to see what we can find. But this is our hypothesis. This is what we think is affecting the loading machines. That there's an attacker learning curve. And that um, it takes, uh, the longer it takes uh, the um, attacker to climb your learning curve, the longer you've got. That's your honeymoon. So what we think, what, the reason we think there's a, a learning curve is because, and the reason we think that the rate speeds up after the first vulnerability is found is because that the knowledge gain from, from attacking something and successfully weaponizing an exploit um, allows you to um, build a set of tools that you can reuse. It allows you to find vulnerabilities that are similar without expending nearly as much resources. 
Um, and we think there may also be something like a blood in the water effect going on here. If someone announces that they found an exploit in um, product Z, everybody else starts looking at product Z because they want to find an exploit there too. And so that's what we think that's going on. So the last um, convincing piece of evidence that we got that, that made us think that, that the honeymoon effect is the learning curve came when we realized that that very first vulnerability, the one that destroys your honeymoon, there's actually two types of, of these. And, and most people forget this. And I, I'm not sure that this is even um, a, an area that people pay much attention to. But we, as, as engineers, as, as coders, as developers, tend to believe that we introduce new bugs with new code. We, we're human, we write buggy code, we know that. So we expect that every time we write something new, there's going to be problems with it, and then we'll fix them, and, and then it will be OK. So that's a, code that, uh, or a bug that is introduced in a new piece of code. That's what we're calling a progressive. But the second kind of vulnerability um, that can be the very first vulnerability in a brand new release of a product is something that we're calling a regressive vulnerability. That is, the product, maybe, maybe the product at version 4, and a, a new vulnerability is found, but it also affects version 3, and version 2, and version 1. That means that the, the software that introduced that bug existed in version 1. But the bug itself lay dormant until it was discovered in version 4. We call this regression. Now, because we're trained to believe that new software, and, and from our own experience, I mean, software I write has bugs in it. Um, but because we are trained to, to expect this, one would expect that most of the first vulnerabilities found will be that those easy to find, low hanging fruit, progressive vulnerabilities. But that is not what we found. What we found is that 72% of the first vulnerabilities ever found in a brand new release of product affect code in early releases. They were not, they did not originate in that release. They were not a result of new code. 83% um, for open source, 59% for closed source. And what's really interesting is here is there's still a positive honeymoon. They may have been introduced in three versions or 10 versions before but they still take longer to find than the vulnerability after them. So I think what I want to say here is new code is better than old code, even if it's crap. <laughs> even if it introduces new vulnerabilities, you get a, a, a grace period, a safety period. Um, and you get a significantly long, um, twice as long honeymoon period, the more new code you can get. So new code is a driver. It, it forces attackers to relearn your system. It makes their tools no longer work. It makes them expend resources. It costs them time. It costs them money. It's exactly what you need to do to up your side of the arms race. So early on in a product, extrinsic properties matter more than the quality of the software itself. And more importantly, the discovery of a new vulnerability appears to depend on how familiar the attacker is with the product. Software, even weak software, even insecure programs are protected by this learning curve. And for our sake, what does that mean? It means that vulnerabilities are not the same as bugs. And you know why they're not the same? Because their extrinsic properties are different. The extrinsic properties of a software bug are static. They are fixed at the time of the software the release. It needs this operating system. It needs this much RAM. It needs this CPU. They are so well defined and well understood that they are printed on the box when you buy the software. The extrinsic properties of that relate to vulnerabilities, I don't even know what they are yet. They are not well defined. Hell, they are not well understood. The security community hasn't even delineated all of them yet. All we do is say, we know this is a problem. We know this is a problem. We know these, this is a problem. But we don't know what they are yet, how we measure them. Um, 
So what makes the honeymoon effect important, and this is why I'm glad you're here today, is because we need to develop a, a way to tell people, here's where you are in the vulnerability life cycle. Here's what you can expect, and here's how you can protect yourself. In other words, we need metrics. If, um, I, I don't know if you, if you know, Matt Blaze wrote, wrote um, a paper on, on safe practice, the computer scientist. Um, when he goes and buys safe, and our lab is full of them, um, we know that when they have a particular UL rating for 30 minutes, that that safe is secure against all the extrinsic properties that can, can crack a safe, from an arc torch to, um, to ha hammer and chisel to um, acid, to whatever you can put on it, I know that if it's got a UL30 rating, it will it is safe from attack for 30 minutes. So I make my security by having my guard walk around every 49. Um, we don't have those kind of metrics for software yet, and that's what that's what we think the honeymoon effect might help us develop. Recognizing that this honeymoon effect um, is a result of familiarity um, means that that. Okay, what can we do to increase the attacker learning curve? Um, the best possible thing to do would be to, to rewrite your code every three months. The minute you, the minute you ship it, throw it all out and start over from scratch. Um, okay, that, that's, that is not gonna happen. Um, but we can do other things. How about um, some form of code, code obfuscation? There are definitely problems with that, but it does seem to work for Qmail. And Qmail, as far as I know, has no, um, um, publicly released um, exploitable vulnerability. Um, there are also things like dynamic execution. Go ahead, Matt. So, um. so I just want to point out the implications of, of Sandy's research, which I'm enormously proud of, you know, in, 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 in terms of the, the, the so what. Now Essentially, the message of what we looked at from the data, and, you know, we can't explain why this is true, but I want to emphasize the single point here is that Everything taught in software engineering school, when you go to software engineering school, you know, the, the first thing they tell you is code reuse is good. Reuse your code. Um, bugs are bad. And what we've discovered is that in practice, the software engineering wisdom actually makes software less secure. It's that code reuse and, and um, uh, emphasis on the bug life cycle that actually pushes the vulnerabilities out in front in new releases. So essentially the, the so what that, that isn't on Sandy's slide is we have to rethink the way we teach software engineering uh, for security purposes. Um, the the um, basic precepts of, the, of that field seem not to be working at all for security. So sorry for that interjection. This is, um, that's save my, your voice for a my second. advisor. <laughs> I'm proud. Um, anyway, so the other thing that we can do, um, we've got to develop some technique that builds into software anything that can create that can increase the attacker's learning curve. Um, I, I've been looking at research into dynamic execution, and I think that that looks interesting. Can you change? Can you make um, functionally the same and um, but but executionally different binaries. Um, that's a possibility. Um, what I'm also looking at now is adaptability rates, and I hope to have a, a paper coming out on this in, in a week or two, uh, a position paper on, um, so that if you're the defender, how fast you need to release your changes in order to stay ahead of the game. So um, look for that soon. At this point, I'm going to turn the time over to Renderman He's been looking at things from the attacker side, and he's got some interesting ideas uh, um, and examples of what he thinks are practical, uh, um, practical demonstrations of the honeymoon in action. So we're going to switch here. All right. And, well, first thing, I have to switch my hat here. I owe Scott Moulton a favor, so I, I, I said I'd wear his hat uh, in the talk. Um, Oh, apparently speaker notes don't translate from OpenOffice to Microsoft PowerPoint. <laughs> but the microphone works. Oh, apparently the microphone's working now. Um, so when I first heard about this paper from uh, Mouse, I 
started thinking about it like I do everything that she tells me because she's always got something cool. Um, I started looking at for practicals, practical examples of this in my own life. I deal a great deal with wireless. You know, everybody knows it's my thing, but the problem was attacker tools are not well documented. She was pulling CV, uh, CVA, uh, E reports, uh, NIST, all those other sites. Um, a lot of the attacker tools, you don't know when they specifically implemented things because it's the underground economy. It's not, you know, the whole formal process because it wasn't some lab that came up with it. So it's really hard to pin down some of these initial uh, dates when things happen. But even if you, on this rough timeline, you can, you know, do approximate guesses when things came in. You can start to see this honeymoon effect in real life, in everyday things. So I'm not an academic. Uh, I'm a rubber meets the road. But I play one on TV, yeah. But I'm a rubber meets the road kind of guy. I want to see how does, I so often will read an academic paper and I'm like, okay, how does this actually affect me? What is the, the real world implementation of this? And I actually found a whole bunch of it within my own life and I thought it was really neat. Um, so I started looking, whoa, <laughs> I started looking at WEP. Um, for those of you, quick timeline here. It was originally ratified in September of 1999 and, whoa. <laughs> Uh, used RC4. Oh, okay. No, it's just throwing me off. Um, so it was originally ratified September 1999. Used the RC4 ciphers. Um, there was a first major cryptanalysis was 2001. Uh, August of 2001, AirSnort was first released. This is what most people consider the first practical web attack. Web attack. Practical is in quotes because really it was like 10 million packets needed to be collected. It was like a whole day's worth of traffic. And even then, it was kind of a shot in the dark. It was never anything that I ever found truly practical, but it was the first, it was an implementation of the cryptanalysis. Where the rubber really hit the road was in 2004, 2005, when Chris Devine first released Aircrack. Uh, I can't find an exact date for its first release, but archive.org says it's about 2004, 2005, around December. Now the interesting thing was the Apple Airport released in July of 1999. This had a really high price tag. It was like over $500 when it first came out. The Linksys WAP 11 that came out in 2002 had a much cheaper price tag. About, uh, I think it was about 100 bucks off the start and it's now down 50 and I mean now you can get these things dirt cheap anywhere. And I'm thinking these are the wrong slides that you loaded up for some reason. I'm missing them. I think I might be missing some slides here. So once Aircrack was released, features were added very easily. You know, ARP injection, chop chop. Uh, you had a framework to work with. So now attackers that are looking at web, you know, starting to poke and prod at this new thing that's you know starting to permeate the rest of all of our lives. Um, starts picking up development. It's easy to now just add a new feature. Aircrack NG picked up development after Chris Devine just vanished. Um, there's an extrinsic factor for you. You know, if your author just suddenly disappears, um, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, I don't have any of my timelines in this. I'm not sure where, what, you got these other slides, but okay. I pulled them off of the key you gave me. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but by 2007, WEP is fairly idiot proof to break. I mean, Spoon WEP came out, you know, it's included in Backtrack. There's a whole bunch of point and click WEP cracking apps, you know, it's, it's now, you know, you can literally teach your mother to do it. Many of you probably taught your mother to do it. But it's interesting because by 2003, WPA had completely superseded WEP, according to the IEEE. They had said, WEP, we know it's got vulnerabilities, we've got problems, don't use it anymore. So this is even before Aircrack came out. This is even before the tools, uh, the framework started coming around fully deprecated in 2004, but as anybody who's doing war driving or any wireless analysis knows, it stuck around. Web, it's the thing that would not die for the longest time. The PCI standards started, uh, started banning web as late as 2009. So you've got this, this almost five year gap between when vulnerabilities were found and when it was finally dealt with within industry and somebody was saying, you must change out this uh, protocol or else you can't, you know, process payment cards. TJX was the, the vulnerability, the uh, exploitation that just kept on giving for guys in the wireless community. It was initially penetrated in March of 2005. This is actually just after uh, Aircrack 
uh, came out. But this is long after there was initial problems being shown. They didn't start their conversion until almost six months later in October. So th there's this weird thing that they, tools were out there, industry knew that they were out there, but they never did anything. This is what I'm basically calling the divorce period, where you've got your, your honeymoon is set, it, it, your honeymoon is there, initial vulnerability comes out, okay, there's a problem, um, you, you know, things aren't, aren't the greatest, but you know that if you assume a positive honeymoon all the time, you know, the positive amount of time, you know your best days are behind you. Suddenly, the next thing that's going to come along and probably put that nail in the coffin is going to be a much shorter timeline. This is where you need to start divorcing yourself from this problem software, thinking about maybe upgrading to the next version, or maybe even just seek counseling in some way of mitigating this problem. <laughs> your IT staff. Yeah. Always buy your IT staff beer and pizza. You know, I, I say this at so many like, different conferences, but they're the guys that know this is the system that's like three versions behind, that's out of date, you know, it needs to be dealt with. That is like the best investment you can possibly make. So there's this long honeymoon for practical attacks. I'm talking in the order of years. You know, some of your, your data you were saying uh, when we were talking before, you know, only had a resolution of one day. For Microsoft stuff, you could probably count, you know, the minutes. But on the protocol level, how do you change out, you know, a billion access points if suddenly the, the protocol is broken? You can't do that easy. Uh, I've spoken with the chairman of the IETF, who was actually on the committee for 802.11i when they were implementing WPA2. They were absolutely terrified of mass obsolescence. That's the reason that the first version WPA, the interim, used RC5, you know, all the, or, excuse me, RC4, that was already implemented on the hardware. It was something that they could just graft onto the existing stuff. You can't just suddenly gut a billion routers and, and just dump them in the trash. That'd be stupid. Um, but it was something that you need to, to think about, get ahead of that curve. If you know that by the time that first point hits, it's only gonna get worse, well, assume the worst and keep going. The cost of equipment is a huge external factor. If you know, it's a $500 device, I'm probably not gonna buy it and, and tear it apart and see how it works. But if it's a $100 device, that's easier to, um, uh, to get past uh, your budgets, get into, you know, throw it on the lab, take it apart. I mean, we've all bought stuff and taken it apart and wondered, hmm, okay, where was that warranty card? Um, <laughs> where was that instruction to put it back together? But the framework, once you've got an existing framework like Aircrack, development just starts snowballing. But at the same time as that, you've got increases in adoption, increases in interesting places that start implementing wireless, bigger businesses, retail outlets, stuff like that. But that, it, you just know things are gonna get worse. In 1999 to 2005, WEP was considered suitable, though weak, you know, they admitted it. But post air crack, the attack vectors multiply, ease increases, WEP is just no longer suitable. So you can look at other things like code reuse in these protocols, because, you know, like 802.11i is just an addendum to the whole, you know, wireless, uh, Pro, uh, protocol standard, you know, they're, they're still using underlying things. So things like deauthentication attacks still work even when you're using a, a WPA2 network. The uh, WPA TKIP attacks reuse the chop chop attack, which is originally de developed for web. You know, so one thing helps another because you now already have an exploitation framework. The other thing that, again, I don't know what happened with the slides, but uh, what I had also found was that as you go along and you start looking at, okay, here's when things were ratified, here's where things were released, you know, here's where Aircrack came out. There was other things like the monitor mode drivers that AirSnort introduced. There was the AirJack uh, inje injection uh, drivers uh, that were around. Um, then, you know, you had all these little pieces that added up and people started integrating them into these frameworks. Then you had all the pieces necessary for a complete tool to, you know, break web in 60 seconds. Other external factors in other things that we're all familiar with. PlayStation 3, you know, Sony comes out with this wonderful thing and they've got, you know, this install other OS and everything. They seem to be playing nice thing, you know, people wanting to use this thing for research. 
how many universities bought these things you know, in, by the pallet to set up cheap supercomputers. Um, I know that uh, uh, the US, I think it was the US Navy has like 1,700 of these things that they're using a, for parallel processing. So in March of 2010, uh, Geohot found that, wait, I might be able to use this install other OS thing to get direct access to the hardware to do other cool stuff. Sony's reaction was to pull the install uh, other OS option through a firmware update. So either you didn't update your machine and you couldn't play online, or you play, played online and you lost this option. It had been several, the, the, the unit had been out for several years by this point, and suddenly the, um, uh, it, it, you know, no, nobody had had any real practical attacks on it. Suddenly they pull this rug out from devel developers who've been using these things. I mean, I wonder what that happens with the Navy when they have to send one of these things in for warranty. You know, do they get back a reflashed one with the new firmware that doesn't support this? Um, so by J December of 2010, this is only like uh, nine months later, initial weaknesses were shown in, uh, uh, was it 25C3 in uh, Europe? But by January of 2011, I should be in 11, Geohot basically found the master keys that allowed you to sign any software you wanted to run on these things and ran with it. So a hell of an extrinsic factor is don't piss off your customer base. You know, if you've got a whole bunch of people really pissed off that you changed their product out from under them, you're pointing a big target on the back of your head. So how many you know, companies do you see that do um, contests where it's like, oh, we're, our product's hack proof, we'll, we'll you know, put it out there for test and everything like that. I mean, you are just asking for things to happen. Uh, I mean, Sony, Lulsec, and honest, like, they have painted like, the biggest target on their head that I can possibly imagine. But it's a matter of thinking, okay, you've got this initial release, you know, it's going to be a while before the tools come about to exploit this. When they start coming together, you know that the best times are behind you. You got to figure out how, okay, how do we mitigate this? Do we need to upgrade? Do we need to flash a new firmware on whatever? Upgrade protocols, procedures, something. But understanding that that, where that point is likely to be before it gets really bad and, you know, and, you, know you can teach your mother to, to own a, a device. That's where a lot of the value of this research came in for me. Um, I've been doing some work with uh, Aruba Networks. They're implementing Suite B encryption on their products for doing uh, secret level stuff over wireless. It's basically an NSA developed and supported uh, set of configurations for wireless gear. So suddenly you can you know, have wireless on base at a, a, and use an iPad to access things that are theoretically secret. Um, I'm willing to get out and say, because this stuff is only being implemented at the higher level, you've got like a you know, several thousand dollar price point that you're gonna have to break through. That is going to be a major barrier to entry. So for several years, you know, X years, you're gonna have no major attacks against this. But as soon as there's an open source implementation, when I can load like Sweet B level encryption on like a, a Linksys router or something like that and interact with it at home, Suddenly, I'm sure within like X minus one years, like so however long it takes for those, uh, uh, before that uh, open source implementation comes out, it's gonna be a much shorter period, meaning there's gonna be a positive honeymoon, but it's gonna be a shorter period before somebody figures out some sort of vulnerability or, or way to manipulate or abuse this. So research like this for me proved that okay, maybe all those academic papers that I was ignoring because I didn't think they were applicable actually do. And I would hope the rest of you would look at your environments and think, okay, how can I apply this? What do these numbers tell me? And can I plan ahead and sort of get an idea of when things will go bad? So, thank you. Thanks, Winder. Um, you bring up some interesting points. And there's something I'd like to conclude with. Um, by calling to mind, um, how many of you have played around with smart cards? Um, smart cards honeymoon is just about over. And the reason it's over is because it's cheap now to get, uh, um, I have with me a nice little toy. I have a 16 channel logic analyzer right here that I can plug all sorts of wonderful little wires into 
and stick the rest of them onto um, whatever device, whatever bus I'm trying to snoop. And suddenly, I have complete access to communication. I'm a grad student, and I can afford this. Um, I'm a drunk hacker, and I can afford that. Um, now that hardware tools are cheap enough, hardware's honeymoon is over. Um, no one can rely on cost or obscurity anymore. Um, the entire economic environment, ecology, if you want to think about it in, in a biological term, has changed. It's no longer disgruntled teenagers in their parents' basements. It's highly financed um, organized crime. It's nation states training up um, their children to be tools or to be weapons or to, or to know how to use the tools and weapons. And that changes the honeymoon as well. And these are extrinsic to the quality of anything, whether it's hardware, firmware, or software. And that's a scary, uh, that, that keeps me awake at night because I don't know how to solve this problem yet. Um, what I'm hoping that you'll take away from this is that we have to, the, the way that we fix software now is broken. We cannot rely on the patch and pray cycle anymore. We have, as um, security people, two models for how we protect ourselves. We use the Center for Disease Control model, which is that you inoculate yourself against everything that you know that's out there, and then you stick yourself out there and you wait to be attacked. And then when you do, you clean yourself off and you go into detox for a while, um, and you do it again. And the only other model that we've got is the military model, which is um, the castle and moat. Um, you dig a huge moat around yourself and you put up really high walls and you carefully control the ingress and you carefully control the egress and you stick yourself out there and you wait until you're attacked. And that's it. We can't do that anymore. In, we're losing this arms race. Every piece of um, research that I could find whether from, from anybody from Semantic to Secuni, anyone that, to OWASP to Brian Krebs, to anyone that watches vulnerabilities and that watches exploits and that watches the marketplace, the attackers are winning this game. And it's because we patch our software and we fix our hardware the same way we fix our bugs. And we're not learning from that. And that's what we're going to have to change. So I really appreciate your attention. And I'll take any questions. So. Thank you. Yes. Um, the, the Honeyman paper, A Familiarity Breeds Contempt, was published at ACSAC in 2010, so it's available on their website. Um, the position paper about adaptability should be out um, on crypto.com within about two weeks. Um, uh, all of our data is publicly available. It's from, from the NVD database, the NIST database, OWASP, but Doug tra bug track, Secunia. Um, so you can just run the numbers the same way we did. So. Um, in a way, I am. Um, or at least run as fast as they do. So his, his comment was it sounded like we're advocating a third model, which is outrun the attacker. And that may be our only defense, because we're, you can't win a defensive war anyway, right? All you can do is maintain, the best you can do is maintain a status quo. So, or at least stay inside your enemy's OODA loop, if any of you are military people and, and know that term. So, well, thank you very much.